I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the Biotech Center at UW Madison. I also work at UW Center on Cooperative <coughs> Extension. The United Lab in conjunction with the Wisconsin Alumni Association and the uh, Science Alliance of UW Madison. And tonight it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Chutsky, <coughs> a longtime colleague, starting 10 years ago when he moved here from Minnesota. Uh, he's had several positions in cooperative extension. He's currently a cooperative extension state specialist uh, through the Department of Biological Systems Engineering. Back when I was a youth, we called that Ag Engineering. Um, he was born in Valparaiso, Indiana, and graduated from Coutts. Coutts. Coutts High School. Coutts High School in Indiana. <laughs> and then he went to Purdue. By the way, Purdue was playing here on October 14th, I think. I'm a Badger now, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I morph. I've been several places. You're not a bear fan. I'm not going to comment on that. Oh. <laughs> uh, as a load, that was a loaded Are question. Are you now, or have you ever been? <laughs> <laughs> Please. So he got all three degrees at Purdue. Uh, all three of them were in ag engineering. Um, tonight, he gets to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the future of agriculture. As I said in my little missive. Yesterday, um, this is the one year anniversary of the death of my ag teacher. It's always nice to remember people who were really influential in your life. Uh, for me, that was Al Teepin, along with quite a few other people. But I, it's pretty amazing to think what we were studying in freshman ag in 1971 and how the flip and feel of the land is now. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a long time ago. And as I said, it's hard to see five or ten years in the future, but that's what John's going to try to help us do tonight. So please join me in welcoming John Chesky Wednesday Night Lab as he talks about agriculture's big challenges and opportunities in 2027 and beyond. All right. Thank you, Tom. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I really want to say thank you to Tom. I, I've known Tom now. I actually came here in 2008. We came from the University of Minnesota. My wife and I moved our two kids. July, almost exactly uh, nine years ago now. And I got to know Tom fairly quickly and we worked, there's about a two or three window there, two or three year window where we worked pretty closely together. We tried a, a program series with the Madison Public Library System. Didn't really quite fly as well as we thought it might. No, but it failed. It failed, okay. <laughs> but, but Tom, I, I just wanna say you've been, really, you've been really great to work with. This is my first Wednesday night at the lab. I kind of feel like I've kind of graduated up to the big leagues here tonight which is kind of fun and exciting. And Tom, I do want to thank you for all of your great work um, serving the state of Wisconsin and beyond. I think you really do exemplify the Wisconsin idea. So thank you for all of your support, especially. That was the $20 version. Yeah. And I, I especially. I especially thank felt it. You're welcome. I especially felt it when I was up in the dean's office, which was you know, the better part of that, that nine years. Tom, let me just clarify, do I have 55 minutes or do I, did that, did your five minutes include that? <laughs> <laughs> like, do I get cut off at eight o'clock sharp? Well, I'm never asking if you get cut off. Okay, we're just, we're just uh, gonna. No, you can talk for as long as you would like. Yeah, no, I won't go as long as I like, but yeah, we'll, we'll. Okay, let me rephrase it. Yeah, you can do I've got about 55 minutes of material prepared and I'm happy to, more than happy to take questions when we're done. As Tom said, I'm a professor in biological systems engineering. I also do a lot of work around the state and really kind of now around the country a little bit as well. Some of you might wonder, where is biological systems engineering? If you go down right here to the north end of Henry Mall and you look at the Horde statue, I always kind of see William Horde is kind of looking a little bit to his right. And if you look just a little bit further, he'd be looking right at our building. So we're kind of on the northwest corner of Henry Mall. Um, biological systems engineers design, manage, and apply engineered systems and innovations to improve food and energy systems. And we do all this while we are also kind of diligently working to protect and sustain our, our valued natural resources like water and soil. Um, in ag engineering, I still call it ag engineering, we have about 225 undergraduates. We're one of the programs in the College of Ag and Life Sciences. We're growing pretty dramatically. In fact, I'd actually say we are pretty close to having some growing pains. That's a good thing right now 
in this climate and environment where having a lot of students means that you're a healthy, viable program. Our program is also accredited by ABET, that's the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology. And we have a very active extension and research program. We co collaborate and cooperate. We have a lot of connections, obviously, in the College of, of Engineering. But being housed in the College of Agriculture, we certainly do a lot of work with colleagues throughout all of our academic departments and units. Um, I just want to, real quickly, as a faculty member, my, I, I have really a three-part appointment. I'm involved with both with, with research and extension, but I'm also in, pretty heavily involved in teaching. But my research and extension work focuses on like engineering and design work to address, I'm just going to call them high-risk issues in agriculture, especially high-risk issues that involve people, production systems, and the environment. You might call that occupational health and safety. We're doing some of that kind of work, but we're also looking at some of the new like technologies and practices. Um, this picture here is from a recent fatality that involved a person working outside who was exposed to hydrogen sulfide gas in a beef cattle situation where they were feeding a large amount of high sulfur a high sulfur feed product, and, and we're kind of doing an in-depth investigation, in-depth research. So that's just one example. There's a whole story behind this one slide, and I just wanted to kind of give you an example of some of the type I'm some of the types of work that I am involved in. So uh, let me just tell you about three or four weeks ago, my wife took me, literally, she hauled me to the Overture Theater, and I got to see the Book of Mormon. I don't know if you, any of you saw Book of Mormon. I was actually, I was just astounded. I loved the play. It was great. I'm not going to do the Book of Mormon here tonight. <laughs> but it, it did inspire me. And the other thing that inspired me a little bit is I've been reading this book on how to do a really good TED Talk. And the TED Talk book says that you need to divide your talks into segments. Like 17 to 18 minutes is optimal. Actually, if you can get it down to 14, you really are able to capture people's ex attention span a lot better. Um, I can't pack everything into a 17-minute talk, so what I've decided to do is combine the Book of Mormon concept with the TED Talk concept, and I've got three acts here tonight. So I've got like three parts to my presentation, and hopefully we'll keep this organized. I promise you this will not be a musical, okay? Um, let me start out by talking about our world that we live in right now. And we could spend a whole, a whole session, or maybe even a couple sessions, talking about this fact that there is a lot of very positive stuff happening in our world right now. In fact, when we're done here tonight, I'd like for you guys to all go out and talk about this a little bit because it's pretty obvious despite everything we're seeing and hearing. I was just listening as I walked over. I've got the app on my, my uh, phone. I'm able to listen to MSNBC or CNN, and you know what they're talking about on there tonight. Um, but despite everything that we see and hear and read and maybe even feel in our hearts and in our gut, our world is not going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, it's truly not. And despite all the you know, fits and spurts and some of the apparent setbacks, there's a lot of really great things going. We need to continue to be very vigilant, but there are great things happening. Again, we could spend two hours unpacking this. I wanted to refer you as a starting point here to two uh, really exciting, I think uh, they're kind of like aggregated or curated articles. I know that a lot of you are avid, like you're into research and science and data and charts and that kind of thing. The two articles um, are a combination of research papers, government documents, white papers, things like that, and other really, I think, really high quality sources. And if you comb through these two that I'll show you in a second, you could probably spend a couple days just looking at all this stuff, and it really is an inspiring story to tell. The first is from Atlantic Magazine back in the latter part of 2015, and the, the article was titled, 2015, the best year in history for the average human being. And this article, like, it lays out some compelling and really positive facts around the progress that we've made around issues like combating hunger and disease, reducing poverty levels, promoting concepts of democracy and freedom, and supporting and facilitating education. And I want to say, I want to kind of call this out. It's going to be a theme of several things I talk about, especially promoting education for young girls and women. It's just a really important part of our future world. The second one is very similar. I don't like the name of this website, but I love the content. It's called Vox. I don't know if, has anybody here ever looked at the Vox website? 
If you ever want to go really deep into current affairs, current issues, current scientific or societal or governmental issues, Vox is excellent. Vox is actually created and the editor-in-chief is Ezra Klein. Some of you might recognize him from MSNBC where he was a commentator, but he cut his teeth more at like uh, the Washington Post and he also was a staff writer and commentator for the Bloomberg News Corporation. And it's, it's very similar. They add to the Vox article issues connected to leisure time, which is kind of a measure of how successful a civilization is or a society or community. Um, also looking a lot at things like violence and homicide. You would, again, think by reading the news that things are really bleak and, and bad. Now I will say that since 2015, the war in Syria has obviously cast a big shadow but if you look beyond Syria, we're actually not in the terrible place that a lot of us would believe by reading the media. So good things in politics and media aside, at least here for tonight and maybe tomorrow, um, I, I don't want to be too much of a Pollyanna when I say this. Um, and by the way, we're, we're in a good place right now as a world, as a society, as a, as a global community. We're, we're there for a reason. This didn't just happen accidentally. Um, but I want to say it's, it's crucial that we not take our eyes off the ball. We absolutely can't. And I want to spend this kind of first act telling you a little bit why. First of all, I want to talk about this kind of famous cover of Economist magazine back in 2011. Actually, February 2011. In, bless you. In October of 2011, the world crossed sort of a magic threshold. We crossed that threshold of 7 billion people living on the earth. They actually say that it was October 31st. I don't know how you exactly measure that it was on that particular date. But sometime in 2011, we crossed that threshold of 7 billion people. I just will say to you, as of 9.06 last night, there is a, a website. You can go and look at like it's constantly moving digits. As of 9.06 last night, we were at about 7.51 billion. So that number is increasing pretty dramatically. And the United Nations estimates that by the year 2050, we're going to have 9.7 billion people living on Earth. So there's been a lot of talk. People involved in agriculture and you know, deans of colleges and extension and places like John Deere and Monsanto and the big agricultural companies, a lot of talk about feeding 9 billion people and why that's so incredibly important. Going from 7.5 to 9.7 billion people. I think if you do the math, that's only about a 29% increase. Doesn't sound like a lot of people. But that many people, that's like taking the current, oh, it's almost like taking the current countries of China and India and doubling them again and putting those people here on Earth. An extra 2.2 an extra billion people is a lot of people. And, and those, again, are mouths that we need to feed. Now, what I want to say to you is that's really important. 29% growth is a big deal, or 30% growth is a big deal. However, the real issue and the real concern is about having to actually double <coughs> agricultural production. So how do we get to doubling it if we're only going to grow population by 30%? The whole doubling phenomenon has three main components. The big one is population growth, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Another one is, I'm just going to call it food per capita. So that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to go out and eat more calories. I mean, that is going to be part of it. But what's the other part of it? The other part of it is as societies grow and mature and become more affluent and able to have more disposable income, what is it that they go after? What, what is the type of food that they tend to seek out more, more commonly? Protein. They're looking for high quality protein. They're looking for hamburgers and steak and poultry and pork and eggs and, and fortunately for the state of Wisconsin for dairy products. I ask this question all the time of college students. How much money do you have at the end of the week with, in your food budget? You know, it's like $1.60. So they in, end up going to Woodman's or down to the local little uh, convenience store and they buy ramen. When you have the money, what are they gonna buy? They're gonna buy burgers and steaks and chicken and they're gonna really uh, enjoy that protein. So the, so the, the conversion of people eating, eating more protein is going to be part of it. And then the final one is biofuels. And I think there's been a fair amount of discussion 
in these series about biofuel, so I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail. But when you add those together, we're talking about not just increasing population and food needs by 30%, but we're talking about almost doubling it. You can see actually the projection, if you look at all of the medium sort of growth rate um, projections, the actual number is more like 88%. But that's still a lot of additional food, a lot of additional agricultural production. I want to skip back a little bit to this population growth thing a little bit. I want to backtrack. The growth rates are not equal across the globe. Our fastest growth is expected to occur in the least developed parts of the world, countries like Somalia and Mali and Zambia, Afghanistan, Uganda, and also several countries here in the Western Hemisphere. These are also, this is really important, these are also countries that currently, so the ones that are growing the fastest are also the ones that currently have the biggest food security gaps. So these are data on, um, global, it's called the global, hun the global Hunger Index. The Global Hunger Index includes measurements of malnourishment, uh, children that are wasting and not uh, growing appropriately for their age and for their, uh, for their gender. And it also includes measurements of child death, child mortality under the age of, of five. So you look at these seven countries. These are the seven countries that are cited as having an extremely alarming global hunger index. However, if you go beyond the seven, you're going to recognize some other countries in this list, I'm quite sure. Afghanistan, North Korea, Iraq. And there are also countries in here for which we don't have good data because they don't have much of a government and there's a lot of instability and just a lot of chaos. And that would include countries like uh, Somalia, which is listed as a country of significant concern. So what I want to leave you with here is, yeah, things are going well. We are at relative peace compared to the last many, many centuries in our world, with the exception of Syria, largely. Um, we have to pay attention to this, though, because agriculture is directly connected to world peace and stability. And it's been that way since the beginning of history. I almost said since the beginning of recorded history, but it's been that way forever, as long as there have been people on Earth. Peace and food are directly connected. So we really have to take this issue of agriculture seriously. So we're looking at farmers, people who are working in places like Wisconsin and Minnesota, the most recent state that I came from in 2008, but we're also talking about farmers and subsistence growers, or subsistence growers, subsistence growth in, um, in Africa, in Central America, in places like Guatemala and Nicaragua and Haiti. Um, we're, we're talking about this and at the same time we have a lot of challenges. Um, I think Tom has had some speakers come in and talk about the challenge of water. Um, we also have a finite land base. Like we know that we've only got so much land and a lot of that land is in fact being consumed by human development. Um, we're actually going to also probably lose some of our productive land base as sea levels rise. So there are a lot of different issues here. Agriculture is a big water user. In fact, agricultural systems use about 70% of all fresh water that is used by people. And 70% uh, of it goes toward irrigation. When you map groundwater use here in Wisconsin, obviously counties like Dane County, really big user of water. But some of the other ones, three of our four are relatively rural. Portage County, which is where we grow a lot of potatoes and a lot of vegetables. Washera, a lot of population in Washera County? No, but there's certainly a lot of irrigation. And the, and the fourth one in that list is Adams County. All are prominent producers and irrigators of major important Wisconsin crops. So water is a big deal. Um, I want to also just mention the importance of climate change. Um, there, I'll tell you, I go out and do a lot of traveling in rural Wisconsin and I speak to a lot of farm groups. And I'll just be honest with you, this is still a really tough and complicated conversation to have. And, um, but it's undeniable that things are changing. I mean, every, almost every summer we hear of another 100 year storm event or even there have been a number of thousand year storm events here in the last five or six years. And they're happening even more often. So we're going to expect to see, rather than talking about climate change, I've just been talking about weird, wild, wacky weather, or W to the fourth power. We, that's, that's like un, undeniable that that kind of thing is happening. 
In Wisconsin, we're seeing it manifest largely not so much because of super hot summers, but because of really, really warm winters. And I can feel that even from when I moved to Minnesota back in 1990 with my wife from central Illinois. Things are just, they're changing and they're changing pretty dramatically and pretty quickly. We also need to talk a little bit about the importance, this headwind of what happens when we add all of these animals to help supply the protein needs for our diet. This is actually, anybody want to take a guess at where this picture was taken? Yeah, it's, take, it's a, a live bird market in Vietnam. When I worked in Minnesota, we had a project over there, particularly looking at avian and human influenza and the interface between birds, pigs, and animals. I'm sorry, birds, pigs, and people. Um, it's really important to note that animal health is extremely intimately connected to human health. And we're going to see this even more with the crowded population and with more animals being produced for food. The American Veterinary Medical Association, also known as AVMA, reports that of the, I'm sorry, that the majority, so there's 1,461 catalog diseases in humans that are due to multi-host pathogens that are characterized by their movement across species lines. So that includes people and pigs, people and birds, people and dogs, etc. 75%, a full 75% of the new emerging human diseases, infectious diseases, have been zoonotic. That means that they are able to transfer between people and animals. So again, yet another headwind that we're going to have to look at. There is a close connection which will continue to create these challenges. So let me kind of summarize my act one here. Again, going back to my, my play idea. First of all, we have great things happening. Please read those two sets of articles. It'll take you quite a long time, but I think it's worth it. Please feel free to share that information. And a positive trajectory is very much foreseeable. But we do have some major challenges. We have to double production in agriculture, not just food, but better food, higher quality food, more protein, and renewable energy as well. And then finally, with all of this happening in the agricultural industry, we're going to address these challenges with gusto, but we're going to have some major headwinds. Climate change, land availability, water, and this risk associated with the interface between animal and human health. So how are we going to do this? The question on all this is how do we move ourselves ahead? Um, if we've in fact made great progress, which we have, I've hopefully laid that out for you, at combating hunger and disease and raising the standards of living across the globe, how are we going to lead this thing forward in the next 30, 33 years? So we're talking about 2050, today's 2017. We've got about 33 years to figure out how we're going to feed an additional 30% of our population. This is where I think some basic understanding of history is critical. And I'm just, this is an editorial comment, perhaps a little bit overly political, but I believe every person who is a policymaker or a person who helps lead our country or our state or a county or a village, wherever, wherever it is that you might live, we need to understand history. And I do wish that more people were excited to learn about our past. As a child of the Apollo era, I'm sure many of you remember so vividly the things that happened in the 1960s and the threats of the Soviet Union and Sputnik and President Kennedy and all that stuff. I want to suggest to you something similar, that the answer has to involve a combination of both technology and people. Everybody thinks about the Apollo space program and you think about all the technology that spun off that, but it was really about the people. And that's a, that's a real major point that I want to leave with you here tonight. Technology, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit geeky on you here. Technology change is coming at us, it's coming at us hard and fast, and it's accelerating even more quickly. In some industries, things are just like, whoa, off the charts. If you've spent any time out in California and San Francisco and the Silicon Valley, it's just, um, it's like another world out there. Underpinning a lot of this is a concept of exponential growth. Okay, I'm going to talk about this in fair detail. Exponential growth and the expansion of computing capability, while at the same time, so we're expanding computing capability, but we're simultaneously reducing costs in an exponential fashion. So what is, what is exponential growth? Now, I want, to, I want to compare exponential growth with linear growth. And for those of you who are university, faculty, retired, or otherwise, this is probably like really basic. But it's, it's helpful for me to be able to talk about it. 
If I talk about growing in a linear way, we're talking about growing in a straight line. So let's just say I'm, I'm a kid who grew up on a farm. Back in 1972, my dad started with 80 acres. And let's just say, well, he did. He wanted to grow modestly. The first year, he wanted to double. He wanted to go from 80 acres to 160 acres. But then he wanted to grow modestly after, adding about 80 to 100 acres over a 10-year period. His goal was to get to somewhere around 650 to 800 acres, somewhere in that ballpark. And that's exactly what he did. So at the end, if you're growing at 80 acres per year, what are you going to land at in 10 years? 800 acres, which again is about where my dad landed. If, on the other hand, I was growing in exponential fashion and I was compounding that growth, let's say that you wanted to double every year, at the end of 10 years, instead of having 800 acres, you would have 40,960 acres. That's, that's the power of exponential growth. You all know probably better than I do, or many of you know better than I do, that compound interest works the same way. The difference with compound interest is you're growing at a rate of a few percent, typically single digits. But when you're doubling growth every year, those numbers add up to really huge, just incredible. I, I had a slide that I took out of my presentation, and the slide said I was born in 1960. And if on the day I was born, or as I had on my slide, the day I popped out, if, if my mom if my mom had given me a, a dollar on the day I was born, and we doubled the dollar every year, by, the, by today, by 2017, I would have 144 quadrillion dollars. So again, that's, that's the power of exponential growth. And if my mom watches this, I know I did not pop out. I was a nine, point, a nine pound, nine ounce baby. So I did not just, I did not just pop out. So, <laughs> So let's talk about, like, what does this mean? Um, back in the 1960s, there was a guy named Gordon Moore. And Gordon Moore was a co-founder of the Intel Corporation. Many of you probably know about Intel. They're the ones, in fact, in my personal computer up here, they make the chip. So they've been very prominent in the computer industry since the 1960s. And Moore made an important observation that eventually became known as Moore's Law. Moore's Law says that computing capabilities will grow and grow. And Moore said that they're going to double every 12 to 18 months, right? You guys have heard of, about Moore's Law, right? And that's something close, 12 to 18 months, is something close to 100% compounded growth rate. And over the last 50 years, Moore's Law has held, it's amazingly true how well it's held. There's a lot of controversy about whether we can continue that growth rate. But let me just, what, what does all this mean? What this means is that the iPhone that I have up here in my pocket or up on the podium, the iPhone has more computing power than what existed on all the NASA space program at the time that Neil Armstrong landed on the moon back in 1969. If by, by a factor of several, I don't know exactly, but more computing power in this little $200, $300 device right here. Another way to look at it is if you took the cost of the real basic computers that did exist back in 1960, and you scaled them up at 1960 prices or costs, to match the power of like only the graphic processor chip, which is like the size, it's less than the size of a quarter in my phone, just the graphic processor chip that allows me to do things like what? Look at photos, you know, high quality images. If I took a video of you all, it would help me with that. That graphic processor chip in, in $1960 would cost 600 and, I'm sorry, $600 trillion. If you think about it in comparison, the whole world's GDP currently is only about 78 trillion. So we'd have a, a, a $600 trillion chip in this when the world's GDP is 78 trillion. So this is a big deal. This is what is driving our future. And I wanna talk about what this means and what we see happening across the globe in different, at different <coughs> scales and different levels. I see the two ladies here with the, with the red and the yellow. I'm guessing you guys are involved with, I saw one of you have tractors on your shirt. And I don't know, are you guys involved with like sustainable ag? And I think I might have, are you here on campus? We work on campus, but we're not. Okay, I know I've seen you around before. But I, I want to be really careful. I'm not advocating, I'm not advocating, I'm simply talking about the trends of where things are going. And also realize that there are all different scales and all different kinds of applications as I talk about these five trends. Big data, and not so big data, just having a lot of it. Artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, 
Um, something that I'm going to call the sharing and collaborative economy. I think this is really cool, and it, it's, uh, well, I'll go into it in more detail. And then finally, changes in our workforce and changes in our leadership, which I think is going to be really important for the future. Let's begin by talking about big data, or more accurately, just having a massive, massive amount of data at our disposal. Uh, dis yeah, at our disposal. It's like a virtual tsunami, and that data is growing just like computing capability is growing exponentially. And there's a lot of work that's happening in business and science, developing around big data, things like data science, data mining. There was actually a conference here on campus about maybe three or four weeks ago on big data. So we're beginning to embrace it. There's some of this stuff happening in agriculture. The other thing I want to say is some of the big like mega mergers, so we've heard about like Monsanto and the Bayer Corporation, different multinational corporations getting themselves together in big, like we're talking multi-billion dollar acquisitions and mergers. A lot of that is around the control of data, data in agriculture, data in biology. This, again, this tsunami of data is being driven also by a whole bunch of really new, cool, interesting devices that are out there, like, like drones, as an example. You'll notice I didn't necessarily include drones in my top five list, although they're being used very commonly in places like Wisconsin, California, Texas. Um, I didn't include them, though, because I believe that drones are more of, they're kind of a vehicle or a platform for collecting data. If I fly over an alfalfa field or a grape vineyard and I'm shooting video that's going to be analyzed by an artificial intelligence system, that data that's being collected is it's a high quality HD camera, but it's really a data collection platform or device. We could also send a person through with a, a smartphone and do the same thing. They just wouldn't be able to do it as, as quickly. There's going to be other uses for drones, but that's just one example. Also driving the development is cheap incredibly cheap, like pennies in some cases, cheap and reliable <coughs> sensor systems. And we often refer to these sensor systems kind of aggregated together as the Internet of Things. Okay? Um, this is where it gets cool with you know, small growers and small, because you can employ an Internet of Things uh, system on a small farm for, this, you know, for, for a relatively low cost. Let me give you an example. So a tractor, a John Deere tractor or a Case International tractor out in the field that's connected to the internet. Some of you might say, well, so what? But what if that tractor has in it an air filter that has its own internet protocol address, an IP address, and when it senses that it's beginning to end its use, get to the end of its useful life, it's able to send an email or a text message to the John Deere dealer so that at about the time when that tractor knows or that air filter knows exactly when it's going to poop out or when it's going to become harmful for the engine because we got too much dirt and dust built up, there's going to be a new air filter out in the field. There will be devices in, again, vineyards and alfalfa fields and corn and soybeans that measure sunlight, heat units, water needs, evapotranspiration, pest pressure, and not only will we be able to sense this stuff, but these units or these devices will be able to send Twitter tweets. Oh, God forbid we have more Twitter tweets. <laughs> but we'll be, they'll be able to tweet. They'll be able to send maybe messages to a crop scout to come out and have a look at the pressure that that uh, sensor is picking up. Or maybe even you know, phone in to the local co-op and send a spray unit out to the field. That's kind of where we're heading in agriculture. Um, this whole tsunami of all this data, all these devices, is also being kind of like it's being fed by incredibly, almost embarrassingly cheap data storage devices. Um, I know we have some young ones here in the audience. For those of you who did not, or for those of you who did grow up computers, like I had my first personal computer probably in 1986 or 1987. But I remember, go out, go out and look this up sometime. So look up what a, what a 10 megabyte hard disk cost in 1982 for the first, one of the first IBM PCs. A 10 megabyte hard, like that is so, that's embarrassingly small today. But a 10 megabyte hard disk in 1980, we're talking like $3,000. And now I can go to Best Buy and if I've got, if I've got my credit card or even $20 in cash, I can buy a 128 gigabyte jump drive. It's just, it's just amazing how cost structures have changed 
And because of Moore's Law, how all of this has become so cheap. I want to throw out a caveat here. In the state of Wisconsin, we have to find faster and more affordable ways to transfer this data. High-speed internet access is a big problem. If we don't do it, we're going to get our lunches eaten by other states and by other countries. And it is, it is a real problem. You can go up here to Dane, Wisconsin, just on the other side of the lake. And there are places up in that part of the county, in Dane County, where you can't get a cell phone signal. And that, in the future, is going to be a problem. Trend number two is artificial intelligence. We don't have a lot of time to get into all the details, all the technical um, you know, specifications, et cetera. But again, I want to show you some examples quickly. Three examples in kind of growing levels of sophistication. And I'm going to talk about where this is going in the future. One of them is Siri. Siri is probably, Siri is actually the second most commonly used form of artificial intelligence, whether you know it or not. Now, I have to tell you, I have a love-hate relationship with Siri on my telephone. It is far from perfect. It is still relatively primitive relative to where we will go in the future. Um, the other big one is Google. Google relies heavily on artificial intelligence. I also bought this one at home probably about a year ago at Amazon Echo. Um, I have at home, well, they may watch this sometime, I have a 21 and a 24 year old. Our Amazon Echo has heard some really interesting conversations. Um, uh, it's, probably, it's probably learned a lot. But it, it's sort of a, an example of that kind of next generation of artificial intelligence. If any of you have ever seen the movie, this is kind of maybe going out 10 or 15 years, if you've ever seen the movie Iron Man, uh, Iron Man, um, Tony Stark, right? Tony Stark used Jarvis, and Jarvis was his heads up artificial intelligence assistant. Jarvis stood for just a rather very intelligent system. And uh, Jarvis could do all kinds of things, or can do all kinds of things. He can operate, make decisions, take care and control, control just about anything for Tony Stark or Robert Downey Jr., who my wife very much adores. Um, Jarvis can anticipate problems. Jarvis ha can collect like sensory information from sensors and can make critical decisions based on the data, can calculate probabilities and advise Tony Stark on just exactly what to do or can in some cases automatically take over and make a decision. So that's kind of a direction that we're going with artificial intelligence. I mean, Jarvis is a ways down the road. It would be really cool to have a display like that as an engineer. That just like totally makes me excited. Um, but what's actually really happening in, we, we're seeing some early agricultural applications and you can probably imagine what some of those will be. So pest management, um, like scheduling of field operations and irrigation applications, things like that. But we're seeing some really impressive stuff happening in the healthcare sector. I wanna give you an example of Watson. You guys have all heard about Watson. Watson is the computer that won the Jeopardy game, I think back in 2011, it was a big deal. Think about from 2011 till today, all that exponential growth. So Watson has become even more and more sophisticated. So there are a couple of big projects that are getting a lot of traction and publicity, uh, particularly out on the East Coast. Health professionals are partnering with Watson, so to speak, at some of the bigger healthcare centers, research centers, universities, et cetera. Now, and especially around the issue of cancer. So let's just talk about cancer for a second. If we look at worldwide research, there are about 700,000 cancer articles published in a given year. The average uh, cancer researcher, oncologist, physician, specialist working on cancer, how many articles can you read in a year? If you're, if you're reading a 13-page technical peer-reviewed journal article, typically 100, 150, maybe 200. If people are super productive, I think 200's on the high end. As a faculty member, I probably read 50 to 100 articles a year, the really in-depth ones. But you can, it's, you're very limited. You can give Watson the 700,000 articles, if they're in the right format, those 700,000 articles, and Watson can literally read, digest, sort, store, begin to establish relationships between facts and concepts literally in like 15 to 45 minutes. And you give Watson a day or two or three to begin to use artificial intelligence to put together some ideas, some relationships, some patterns, and what we're seeing happening is that there are some really successful outcomes. Lives are being saved. Um, let me just, using artificial intelligence 
by Watson working with the health, so it takes both, it takes the health professional as well, to suggest new treatment protocols like combinations of medication, precision surgery, using very pinpointed radiation and other types of like cellular and molecular treatment, and all, again, combinations of all of the above. It is revolutionizing healthcare, and we'll see even more of this. The Watson computer is like literally the size of like five Domino's pizza boxes. And, and that's the kind of capability that we will have moving forward in the future. Can this work in agriculture? Yeah, absolutely, we're gonna see all kinds of applications. I wanna give you a major warning, we need people. And when we see some of the you know, reductions in staff, like the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, the people that are working in the applied crops and livestock, some of the extension colleagues that are retiring and probably won't be replaced. We need people that can put together the data, the information, and begin to help computers establish the heuristics and the rules of thumb, rules of thumb that are needed for these kinds of systems to be successful. I need to be careful with my time. Trend number three is autonomous vehicles. This is a totally driverless tractor. That's why when I saw the two of you walk in, I'm guessing, if you're involved in agriculture, you're probably not gonna go out and buy a driverless tractor, but you might buy a drone or some other type of autonomous piece of equipment. We're gonna see also autonomous vehicles. And by the way, this is a concept tractor that was displayed last year at the Farm Progress Show down in Iowa. Expensive, it's, we're talking like a $700,000 piece of equipment. Um, oops. Autonomous vehicles though, we're gonna see probably in the next five years. Google and Tesla and some of the international companies are getting a lot of the publicity, but rest assured there are companies like Ford, GM, Chrysler, or I guess that's not called Chrysler anymore, but you know what I'm talking about. They're, they're actively developing driverless technology. Um, right now, everybody's freaked out. There was a really bad a collision that involved, a, it was a death in, um, I think it might have been Texas or perhaps California, about a year and a half ago. So everybody's freaked out about safety. But I can assure you that at some point, probably in the year 2020 or so, maybe 2022, safety is going to actually, it's going to shift and it is going to become a focal point and a selling point for driverless vehicles. We're talking farm trucks. We're talking, obviously, passenger vehicles, buses, semis, and that kind of thing. The biggest delay will not be because of technology. It'll be because of regulation, because of insurance companies, and those kinds of things. Again, farm applications, I think, will become, it'll, be, it'll come a little bit more slowly, but I will tell you that as a result of a lot of the confusion and uncertainty right now with, re with respect to like immigration policy, there, so, so an automated milking machine, those have been around for 20, 25 years, a lot more inquiries because of the long-term concerns about farm labor. So that'll probably be a driver in the agricultural side. Trend number four is the rapid emergence of the sharing or collaborative economy. In agriculture, we've been doing this for more than 100 years, it's called cooperatives. And now we see cooperatives being used in grocery stores. The Willie Street Co-op is probably my favorite place to shop. I guess I gotta be careful what I say since we're gonna be streaming this. Um, but the cooperative business model's been around for a long time. But we're seeing a major adoption of a, a sharing type or collaborative type of economy in many other types of sectors. Many of you probably used Airbnb or vacation rentals by owner. Uh, we traveled to Lisbon, Portugal last year. I've got the two young kids at home still, and we use the heck out of Uber. So the idea with Uber is it's all facilitated by a software platform with my smartphone. The, the smartphone and the software handles all the information related to payment and relationships and quality, right? So hopefully I'm viewed by the Uber driver as a quality passenger. They're sharing their vehicle. I'm paying for it. The, sh the word sharing is a little bit misleading because we're talking about money being exchanged, right? Um, but you think it's about resource utilization, smart resource utilization. We're seeing this in a small way in agriculture with big agricultural machinery. So you take an example of a $500,000 grain combine. How can we justify buying a $500,000 combine that's only being used 6% of the days during the course of a year? There will be ways in the future to have this type of equipment where people do purchase it. It's gonna be almost like an Uber combine or 
uh, uh, farm equipment that has more of a shared relationship. Again, people are going to need to invest. When I've used this conversation, talked about this conversation before, people are like, they're not going to share a $500,000 piece of equipment. Well, of course not. There's going to be money exchanged, but that exchange and those relationships will be facilitated because of technology. The other thing that I think is cool about all this is, again, it, takes, it, it keeps track of the quality of our relationship. If I go out and rent an Airbnb that's like a total dump, or, if, or the other side, if I go into an Airbnb and I trash the facility, I'm not going to ever be accepted back in. So there are mechanisms to help, again, manage these kinds of relationships. Another part of our collaborative economy, this is Jay Leno. Jay Leno has, anybody know what he's famous for besides having been on The Tonight Show for life? He's a car, yeah, he's a car guy. And so what Jay Leno does is he three, so he's got all these old cars and the parts, you can't get parts for him. So he has a 3D printer. So 3D printing is going to be part of the sharing collaborative economy. With a 3D printer, you can print anything. You can print plastics, titanium, stainless steel, any type of part for any type of machine. Everything from my dishwasher to that $500,000 combine. So I can, I can foresee a time not too far down the road where instead of every manufacturer having its own parts warehouse and, and you know, dealership network, we're going to have regionalized like part depots. So just imagine this, in a part depot, um, that can print anything on demand. Let's say that a part, I'm a dairy farmer and I have a valve that goes out in my bulk tank. Five or six clicks of a mouse or five or six clicks on my smartphone, the depot can go out and download the part requirements from De Laval or whoever the manufacturer is. It all gets transferred within a matter of seconds electronically. The part gets printed at that local or regional parts depot and then three hours later, a drone takes it and delivers it at the farmer's doorstep. That kind of thing will happen. It will happen before we know it. We're going we're gonna to see drones in the air before too long with Amazon book deliveries and other, all the other stuff people buy from Amazon. The technology is there. It, it's a matter of overcoming the logistics and, again, some of the concerns and fears people have. Here's the last one of my trends. Uh, changes in the workforce. This one has nothing to do with technology, at least nothing that I know of. And um, but we're seeing a major shift in our agricultural workforce. I wanted to highlight specifically the role of women. In the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, for about a decade and a half, we have been well over 50% women in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. We approached about 60% back in the year 2000. Um, let me just kind of put this in perspective. When I was an undergraduate student at Purdue, I had 48 people in my graduating class. We had one woman. And she actually left the program at the beginning of her last semester because she didn't feel comfortable. And now when I go back to Purdue and West Lafayette to my old home department, it's more than 50% women in that department. That's a big change. We also know this. When I was a UW-Madison Cal's administrator, I hired a lot of faculty. And uh, about 60% of our young extension specialist faculty were women. They were highly competitive in almost all of our pools and in many, many cases, at least 60% of them, they were far and away the best people who were qualified for those positions. Let me talk about this trend just a little bit more. And as we talk specifically about agriculture, the uh, 2012 Census of Agriculture said that women are making up an increasingly large fraction of the farmers that are out there. They produce about $13 billion in agricultural sales. So that's really important, like for this country. We're going to see that growth continue. But let me also talk about it, this whole, no, whole notion of feeding 9 billion, right? So we talked a lot about that at the beginning. One of the big priorities for groups like the United Nations and USAID is to em empower and educate and get women involved. We know that women make up about 43% of the ag workforce. In some countries, that number is up over 50%. And yet women have, in many cases, in many countries, far less access to capital, to machines, and technology. And yet, if you provide a woman, like again, sub-Saharan -sub -sub Africa, or Guatemala, or Nicaragua, or some of these other countries, you provide a woman with the same resources that a guy has, 
There are 30 plus research studies that show you're going to get 30% more productivity, 30% greater return on investment from women. So they've got to be part of the solution. So this idea that our, we're growing our workforce and we're diversifying our workforce is really cool. It's really, really important. We're also seeing this in US businesses, not just in agriculture. Of the Fortune 500 companies in the upper quartile or the upper 25% with having women on their corporate boards of directors, those 25% or that upper quartile generates a 42% greater return on sales and a 53% greater return on equity. So we've got, to, we've got to focus on, again, education and helping women to, to be successful in agriculture and in all other industries. So summary part number two, and by the way, I know that I've got an extra five minutes because Tom took me all the way till about seven after there, so we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna move quickly here. Summary part two, we've never seen changes like we have seen or like we're seeing today. Major applications in agriculture, if we embrace the possibilities, I do urge some caution. This is not just computers, we still need people. And people cost money and people take, you know, they take support and we're gonna need to continue to support people. And there are some really exciting developments when it comes to the opportunities and growing role of women in the agricultural workforce. So part number three, I want to talk about Natalie. And who is Natalie? Natalie is a young student. She'll be starting back up in September. She'll be starting her third year studying biology here at UW-Madison in, in College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. Or she could be at any one of our Midwestern land-grant universities. There's a lot of Natalies out there. There's also a lot of Noahs. And I mean, there's, there are a lot of kids out there like that. But I want to talk about Natalie. Natalie is a, a millennial. And currently, millennials make up about 36% of our workforce. So it's going to be 50% of our workforce by about 2020 or 2022. Millennials like Natalie will have a bunch of careers. Like I've had like two or three major careers. Natalie will probably have double or triple or even quadruple, a number of significant careers. Natalie will expect tremendous flexibility, fast-paced work, and an ability to control her balance between job, friends, family, and fun. Wouldn't, wouldn't, we, all, wouldn't we all love that? Um, successful millennials will strive to learn, and they will value the whole idea of lifelong learning. We're going to see a lot of Natalie's and millennials here in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. We're going to be fortunate in the year 2027 to have Natalie join UW Extension, or maybe she'll become a faculty member in 2027 here in the College of Agricultural and Life Science. Or maybe she'll join industry. Um, and as a result of all of the change that I can see happening, I want to show you a little bit about what Natalie's day might look like in the year 2027. I'm going to do this pretty quickly, OK? First of all, she will have access to all the technologies that I've talked about. It's going to be at her fingertips. And because she's, she's never really known anything other than being digital and growing up in a digital world, it's going to be a lot easier than it was for many of us who are sitting here in this room. This is going to be second nature. In fact, for our students today, it is second nature. Natalie and her colleagues and partners will be located not only here at Madison and throughout the state, but she's going to have working relationships with people on nearly every continent of the globe. Face-to-face -face interaction will still be important. Um, and she'll value the whole idea of person-to-person, eyeball-to-eyeball contact. However, I want to say this, the idea, and I do this every week, the idea of jumping in a car and driving 200 to 300 miles to go visit a farmer or to go you know, do something fun, whatever it might be, that's going to become more of a luxury. And a lot more of this will be in the future facilitated by, by technology. Not only because of the expense and energy costs, but also because of time costs. Natalie's going to have a lot on her plate in the future. I think a lot of you, I'm guessing, how many of you do use technology now to communicate with loved ones, with family, with grandchildren, with children? I know my mom and dad who are not particularly technology literate are just now getting into Skype and Facebook. Um, and we're going to see even more powerful and cool platforms in the future. Just wait till holograms come on board. Natalie will be required. Not only will she enjoy it, but she'll, required, she'll be required to be a lifelong learner. 
Through technology, she'll have immediate access to the greatest thinkers and educators that the world has to offer. This is an example of a Cisco, it's the Cisco telepresence system. The faculty member who you see up front here is not really there. They're being projected with this telepresence system, and we'll see more of this. Universities will beam their programs and content to every country and to every person who is interested in learning. For a moment, I think Tom Zinnan left, right? Tom Snacker. <laughs> yeah. So, so just for a moment, you know, since I know Tom is a plant pathologist, let's just imagine that Natalie is a plant pathologist in her work here at UW-Matt, or maybe, a, maybe an extension. So she's an extension specialist. She's still going to work with crop growers, and she's going to diagnose diseases in corn and soybeans and cranberries and apples and grapes. But she'll probably use AI, artificial intelligence, like we talked about. But instead of going out and driving 150 miles to collect some plant samples and do a diagnosis and get it back to the lab, um, she might guide a farmer out to the field using virtual reality and actually help him to select the right type of plant sample. And then once they've had some discussion together, she may be able to put up an educational presentation that they watch together. Or she might even show this farmer a simulation that allows him to see what that appropriate treatment for the crop might look like using virtual reality. How is Natalie going to get to work? Well, of course, a driverless vehicle, OK? Um, Natalie will not own her driverless vehicle, um, but she will pay a per mile or a per use cost. Um, the company that she gets this from will use artificial intelligence to optimize the storage and the placement of these vehicles so that Natalie will never have to wait more than five or ten minutes to have access. What's going to accelerate this trend? We've already talked about this. Safety is going to be a big driver. Time use, efficiency, energy. And while Natalie's traveling, she will occasionally travel. So she'll probably go for, to Toma from time to time to go out and look at a cranberry marsh. When she does that, if she's in a driverless vehicle, she'll be able to use her time much more effectively. Studying, learning, being entertained, maybe communicating with others through the same technology that we're talking about as she's transferred to her location. When Natalie's in a place like Eau Claire visiting a soybean field, she might use Airbnb. Again, a lot of you are beginning to use this type of uh, shared economy platform. And as we discussed, as a plant pathologist, Natalie will likely use a whole array of digital tools to collect data and support the agricultural industry, like drones, anything ranging from the five pound phantom drone that you see here, the big white one in the center, or the little bitty dragonfly type drone that'll have a high, you know, high quality digital camera in and will have all of the same capabilities. So she'll be able to fly over a cranberry plant using a smartphone and have pictures and other information sent to the lab. And that lab might be located half a world away. And this will all happen in a matter of seconds. The other thing that's going to happen is Natalie will have access to a lot of information and a lot of data. She'll probably be doing research on farms that are university owned, but because everything is going to be equipped with sensors, there's going to be just ubiquity of data for her to analyze and for her to learn more about. On this topic, I want you to just imagine, if you would, think about a data stream coming, and this is, this is going to happen before we know it, coming from every cow in Wisconsin, every beef animal in the United States, maybe every hundredth ash tree, so we can be looking for issues like emerald ash borer, probably every muskie in Lake Mendota, it's a finite number, I don't know exactly what that number would be, but it's probably in the thousands. Learning more about those fish would be important. Every warm-blooded pet, again, we're kind of heading in that direction, and every person. I know that some of you, this probably creeps you out just a little bit, but as I've been up here for the last 50 or 55 minutes, I have had probably well, several megabytes of data collected. My heart rate. I just actually, I don't know if you saw me look down a minute ago, but I got a buzz because I do pace up here a little bit. I just had, I hit my 12,000 steps. So these are data that in, in the future will help me to improve my health. I also really monitor and watch my, my sleep habits really closely. So this stuff again is happening. Natalie's job 10 years from now is going to be different. It is going to involve all of this data and all of this information, but she's going to still have this human challenge of making sense 
making sense in, in providing the insight and the purpose and the wisdom and the ultimate decisions that are needed. A person is still going to be needed to accomplish all those tasks. The way in which she does it is going to be different, but in my mind, she's got a bright future ahead of her, and there's going to be some really cool opportunities. Um, my, my, final, my final little plea here is for those of you who are parents or maybe grandparents of a Natalie or a Noah or a Haley, Haley and Noah are the two students who work for me this summer, or my two kids, Michael and Jack, if you're one of those people, realize that these young people have an exciting and dynamic and full world ahead of them. It's going to be challenging. I mean, there's some big stuff out there, and we've got to keep our eye on the ball. Encourage our young people, support them, empower them, embrace their interests and talents, even if their mode of operation. How many of you have like a 19-year-old or a 20-year-old grandkid or a child yourself? They're totally different than the way I grew up. But embrace that. They're, they're different than we are. But they're preparing themselves for a new future. Um, we absolutely need them, and our world needs them. Um, I do want to thank some people. I've got three slides. I just want to get this for the record. I've got lots of pictures and data and information. I see a couple people taking photos. I'm happy to share this PowerPoint with you guys, by the way, if you want to see it. This is from section one. There's a lot of stuff here. I have some actual, actual proprietary licensed photos here in the second part on technology. And then this is the third. This is the Natalie stuff. I do want to just say Natalie is obviously a real person, a real young lady, um, but I did find a person on Flickr, that's a Creative Commons website, so Natalie is, that Natalie, there's lots of Natalies here, but that Natalie is not a real student here at UW-Madison. Just wanted to kind of set that straight. I want to thank you all for your participation here tonight, and I'm really impressed with the size of the crowd, and with that, thank you, and I'm more than happy to answer some questions. So, I, you, you're John, right? John's hand. I know John because we work out together at Harbor yeah. Athletic. Is that okay that I, I said that? I want to use a fitness analogy. Uh, All right. Bigger, faster, stronger with respect to agriculture. And I'm thinking 2.2 billion people we're talking about. You, you never once discuss the issue of is there going to be a world of genetically engineered foods that are bigger, faster, and stronger for the population? And it's going to be needed more than ever when yeah. you're trying to. Because I looked at that one slide where you had the, the African countries, and yeah, they made improvements, but you're still talking a third of the population were challenged in terms of yeah. food. Yeah, so I know that there's a question embedded in that, and I'm guessing that that question is probably not controversial at all. The question was about what about genetics? You know, what about bigger, stronger, faster on the genetic and biology side? As an engineer, I purposely decided to stay away from that. I do think, you know, obviously genetic technology, whether it's GMOs or other technologies that are facilitated by an in-depth understanding of genetics is going to be absolutely critical. Um, rather than spending a lot of time tonight in a debate, which I know you're not trying to set me up for, John, but, but I'd rather try to not go there. But I do think, you know, a place like UW-Madison, Genetics, you know, it's, it's primo and king in a lot of our departments, and it will continue to be so. And the understanding of genetics will be vital to the future of making that happen, the 2.2 million people, 2.2 billion people. Gentleman with the hat on. I know you were second to get your hand up. Uh, technical utopia is always something really great. Well, how do we get the social structure that's going to keep that benevolent? So Even with the technology we have now, there are, there are groups of people who are you know, making use of it to be destructive rather than productive. And you're talking about a society where the information being collected would make George Orwell's job. Yeah. So the, yeah, the question is how do we like, facilitate the social structures and, and have the safeguards in place so that we don't have 1984 and that we don't have Big Brother watching every single thing we do. So you guys really, you, you do ask really easy questions. Um, that's, that's a joke. I, I don't have the answer to that. It, it obviously is something that's going to take a lot of thought. It's going to take a lot of leadership. And, you know, I think right now I'm, I'm concerned about that. I don't know that we have 
the thought that is that needs to be given to those kinds of things. There are bad things happening, as we know. There's hacking that's happening. There's uh, you know different groups around the world that we know for sure are wanting to do one another harm. Certain sectors of our society who are wanting to do one another harm, and technology is a key part of their world as well. I'm sure that they could. One of those groups could give presentation and say, look, look at all these cool bad things we want to do in the world and look how wonderful technology is going to help us. And, and that's important that we understand that. But I want to be careful also to not say we need to take our foot off the gas pedal. I think this stuff will also help answer some of those questions. And, and I wish I had a, a much better answer. I do think, again, we need to continue uh, we need to continue to support like social science, so there's engineering science and genetics, and, but we also need to continue to support social science at a place like the University of Wisconsin because that, those people are going to help us find those solutions. Yes, sir? Here's a, okay, so with that being so water intensive, and you know, with the surface area of the earth actually being more oceans than land, why don't we actually, everybody talks about desalinization plants, that kind of stuff, why don't we actually start doing yeah. The water level, right? The the water table of all the land. So yeah, let me. Uh, questions about what about desalinization? If we have if we have all this water need in agriculture, we need all this more food. What about these? What's the answer to that? What do you What do you guys think is the answer to that question? You better have uh, hydrogen fusion uh, power plants. Power yeah, I mean uh, desalinization. I'm not an expert, obviously, but it takes a lot of energy. And it takes a huge amount of energy, and until we develop those kinds of alternative energy sources, which become essentially infinite. Actually, there's a university in Manchester or somewhere in England figured out a filter. Oh, okay. For salt water. Well, we need to get those people connected to agriculture. You're going to have to use energy to get the salt out because you're yeah. still going to have to go all No, they were talking about something like the molecules of the salt were. Yeah, so yeah, I don't want to get into this whole debate necessarily, but to say, so if those kinds of things are happening, one of the things in agriculture we need to do is we need to reach out. We need to be connected disciplines. And I think in agriculture, we haven't always done that very well. So if there are technologies like that available, let's figure out how to make those connections. There is a gentleman back in the back that has had his hand up this whole time. I did not see him because of the light. Okay, I have another curriculum question for the College of Agricultural Engineering, and that is uh, teaching the, resili the science of resilience. Is that a required course in life cycle assessment? I see you do have courses on. We do have courses in biological systems engineering on life cycle assessment. And the first part was resilience. The science of resilience. Yeah, the science of resilience. I mean, I, I think that we have bits and pieces of our curriculum that do, that do touch on that. And I'm assuming you're talking about like environmental resilience. Re resilient systems uh, as opposed to brittle systems. Yeah. So responding to disasters or your wild and wacky weather. Oh, How do you sure. Respond to that with a resilient yeah. system. Yeah, I mean I can speak to one it's one very tiny example and that's the whole idea of a resilient wetland that has all kinds of positive benefits. So we do have a professor and it's part of our curriculum where we teach wetland design. I have a group of students in the senior design class that I just finished up teaching in the early part of May and they're designing a wetland. So and there's some of that that happens, but probably not the degree to which you know, we could be or, or should be. Okay, now I'm gonna come back to this gentleman here who I know you've been very diligent. I, I was just gonna comment, I, I saw an interview, uh, a presentation that came out from Cambridge uh, from last week of uh, Terence Janowski, uh, who's an AI, PhD yeah. in physics and all that kind of stuff. And I was a bit skeptical about, about cars, uh, self-driving cars, until he started talking about what they're capable of. And the, the, one of the things he said that surprised me is only 5% uh, of the time a car is used, 95% is parked. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the new self-driving cars will do massive changes to urban centers. Because you'll no longer need parking lots, you'll no longer need the right. parking structures. You have to change the entire structure of an urban area because cars will simply not be required anymore. Mm -hmm. So basically, only one out of 20 cars will be on the road from here on out once it goes out. So yeah, and the question is from here on out, so like when is that? I, you know, people are saying five, five, five to 10 years. Uh, I, again, I think the big, the big hurdles will not be the technology side. It will be societal acceptance. 
the perception of safety versus not safe, and, and also just policy. Policy and insurance, I think, are going to be too big. Part of it is the insurance companies will not be needed because there won't be any accidents. Yeah. 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 So, so I do. I, I have a lady back in the back, and, and I'm, I'm so happy because in class, I never see anybody doing this. Like, you're so eager to. So, go ahead. Well, I hope you will be happy with my question. Okay. From Steve Jobs back then to speaking about exponential growth of technology, Ray Kurzweil, both of these and others predicted that not only is technology going to grow on us and now exponentially so, but we will become it including robots. So where would food as we know it and agriculture fit with the future robots of us? Yeah, so the question is about what, where, do, where do we go with robots in agriculture? Now, no, no, we are going to become robots. <laughs> oh, that we're going to become robots. Can Ray Kurzweil predict? Yeah. We're not going to only adopt technology big yeah. time, but we are going to become it. So you're talking about the whole singularity that we, exactly. we this all, and, and that we're able to take artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and dump that into our brain, and we'll have extensions of our brain, which will be like a big USB drive that you can plug the 100. You know, I, 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 I listen to Ray Kurz. I've read a couple of his, or at least one of his books. I, I understand kind of where he's thinking. I think some of that is a ways down the road. I think there are so many more pragmatic applications. I mean, your example of decongesting People, they talk about how in New York City and Chicago, more gas is spent driving around the block looking for a parking spot than what is actually spent on doing work in the, in the city of Chicago. So I think that those, you know, those pragmatic types of applications are going to come first. You know, we could probably do like a whole course on your question. What, what do you think? I'm curious to know what you think. I'm an organic gardener. Okay. <laughs> And I buy organic products, so I'm right there with you. Yes, sir, in the green shirt in the back. I don't know if this is uh, in your field enough, but I have a question about, uh, as you talk about moving towards these sharing economies and these economies of scale for some of these operations, I grew up on a farm as well. Uh, most of the smaller farmers I know rent their land out because you can't run less than 300 acres on your own anymore, so they're mm -hmm. profitable. And this consolidation of property that, that, that we need to continue occurring for the sharing economy and, and for the economies of scale with these mass production methods. Where do you see that going for yeah. producers? And what yeah, so I mean, I, I understand your question. What about, the, what about the small farmer? You've got to have at least 300 acres to probably own a piece of um, machine. I'd like to change it, not just about the small farmer, but the opportunity for new players or yeah. others to enter this market. I mean, I personally believe that the collaborative economy creates an opportunity. If you can get a, a, group, a, a group of producers, a group of, and, and this is happening, right? I mean, Organic Valley is a perfect example of a collaborative, cooperative, I don't know if it's the perfect example, but they're able to access resources and a market because they're part of a cooperative that they otherwise, small organic producers would not have, and they're talking about dairy and vegetable growers and that kind of. So I, actually, I think, yeah, like a $700,000 driverless tractor, even on my dad's 1,000 acres of corn and soybeans would have been impossible. But, you know, 20 years from now, would he have been able to own, own a share of that or own some portion of it in a, in a shared way? Maybe not a $700,000, but maybe the $500,000 combine? Um, he did a lot of that, by the way, with having cu custom harvesting is also kind of a, a, a notion of the shared economy in some, in some respects. It's a way to be able to share a, a big resource across multiple domains and multiple, multiple pieces of land in the case of a custom harvester. Uh, I'm going to go with you, and then we'll come to you next, OK? I really appreciate your lecture. It was very stimulating. It's exciting. You, know, you kind of want to get going. You want to see this happen. But most of us have worked at jobs somewhere where you have an administrator above you that either <laughs> facilitates everything you do and really makes it, opens the doors, figures out the problems you're facing, knows what's going on, and uh -huh. the rest of the group. Where's this? <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they are out there. I mean, yeah. that, that would be your good administrator. But probably everybody's also had the guy that's disconnected, just out to lunch, 
doesn't seem to be up to date on anything that's going on. Th this so isn't a commentary on my recent yeah. uh, experiences. <laughs> no. I'm just saying, in our country, for example, to me, just my personal uh -huh. views, our political system is dysfunctional and antiquated. I don't know that it's capable of actually being the administrator for all of these ideas. Yeah. How do we change that? Do you see that as a problem? Yeah, yeah. No, I okay. And again, I know I know Tom wants to turn the video stream off. I and I know Tom wants me to rephrase, but what I think the question is what about leadership? Do we have the do we have the leadership well, the and the leadership and the system? And the system and the will to make this happen. And I just think if you look at industries outside of agriculture, this stuff will happen. I mean, the market will drive it. There are just amazing things happening at places like Apple and Google. Now, that might be scary. I mean, Apple and Google are two like, just multi mega corporations. It will happen. We have to figure out, I believe, we have to figure out how to better embrace it in agriculture. And if we don't, there are countries that will. China is actively moving forward on these kinds of things. There are several countries in Europe that are far ahead of us on digital technology in agriculture. Well, that's my big but, fear, that, that we're sitting here wasting time when the other countries, they have a different system, maybe you don't like it politically, yeah. but I think for certain things and certain types of growth, maybe it works very well, and, but it seems like you just don't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are, are you at the university here? That, that was not a loaded question. I'm just cur I'm curious. Okay. Sorry, with the. Well, I just had a, wanted a comment about a lot of what you proposed has to do with the efficiencies that yeah. have to do with robots, driverless cars, and all of which are going to replace people. So, and some have argued, oh, the technology will just take care of it and the other kinds of jobs. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole other group of people. People who say yeah. that that's not true, that there's just going to be thousands and thousands of job loss. Yeah, no, I mean, you're right. Anytime, anytime you have new technology come into a marketplace and new automation system, you do lose jobs and you change the nature of jobs. But again, I, I would encourage you, this is why I wanted people, I wanted you all to kind of like have a bookmark for those two collections of papers that, again, the standard of living, where people are being lifted out of poverty, I think is, is largely driven by some of the things we've talked about, by the understanding, by the data, by the information. Um, you know, and I'll be honest, I, so I grew up on a farm, I spent my summers <coughs> hand harvesting and selling at a roadside stand, selling sweet corn. Um, I would much rather have had, and my dad would plant Northwest Indiana, he would plant eight rows around the edge of his field. That's where all the sweet corn was, and that's what I harvest and sold to all the power plant workers as they got off of work. I would rather have had my dad plant 80 acres of sweet corn, um, be able to harvest it with some type of an automated piece of equipment. It would have been a lot easier on my body and on my, <laughs> my, you know, my level of heat. I came down with heat exhaust, not heat stroke, but heat exhaustion a couple times. And I would love to have been able to sell my products throughout all of Northwest Indiana where sweet corn was really hard to get your hands on. And that would have only been made possible through more auto. And then, then we're talking back in 1979. So, so I, I, see all, I see both sides of it, but I see some of the labor that will be replaced is labor that we're going to have a hard time in the future finding people to do as countries expand their quality of life and their standard of living. Sir. Can I come back to you in a second? And we'll go to you. Red shirt, yes. Um, what kind of challenges do you see, particularly in like, implementing technology in developing countries? For instance, the US obviously has a lot of places where there are not like, so many people. So yeah. Yeah, so the question is about um, t technology in developing countries. And, and I, I want to be careful. I, maybe I should have said this earlier. There's two kind of like ways in which this technology technology can like manifest itself. One is the $700,000 driverless tractor. The other one is being able to access any piece of, in, I mean literally with this technology today, think about what I can get my hands on on this phone if I know what I'm doing, if I know how to use Google, literally in a matter of seconds. When I tell, uh, let me just kind of go a little bit long here. When I tell my kids, like when I worked on my PhD <coughs> thesis back from 1985 to 1988, 
Like he had to go schedule a session to look up research articles with a librarian and you had to pay. It's like $120 for, like I can do all the same crazy stuff now on my iPhone. And if you look at, again, many of those sub-Saharan African countries, they never had the landlines that we have, but the, a lot of them have smartphones and a lot of them are using technology for learning, for education, for information, for technical stuff. You know, how to manage certain kinds of pests or deal with, you know, a tick-borne virus that's killing off their cattle herd. So, so I think the information part of it is going to be really vital for developing countries. Um, I think we'll see some of the maybe smaller scale, you know, some miniature robotic version of the tractor, but we're not going to see the big $500,000 combines. At least in our, I don't think we'll see them in our lifetime. But this part, the information part of it, I think is just, and I'm guessing you probably grew up, I, I don't want to guess your age, but you probably, you grew up with all this stuff. And, and it's just, for the old timers in the audience, it is so, so different now. And it just opens up so many possibilities. I wish we all as a society appreciated that. I don't mean my smartphone. I mean our ability to learn things about the world. You had a question. Well, I can see how much of what you're talking about can work in the Midwest of the United States as agriculture gets consolidated to fewer and fewer operations but larger and larger. Where I'm having problems is when I look at agriculture in other countries, in which case some cases are well ahead of us mm -hmm. and we're not learning from them. Yeah. But I'm most concerned where the countries want to keep their labor base because they have many people and want to take advantages of new technology. How do we blend the new technology and maintaining the labor in these vastly growing countries? So what do you think? I, I mean, I, no, I'm, I need to speak quiet. I asked you, what do, what do you think? <laughs> I'm not sure our business infrastructure is appropriate for many of these other countries. Hmm. The technology maybe can be neutral, mm -hmm. but it's going to have to fit into different systems. Yeah. Yeah, I know this is kind of a sort, sort of an abstract converse, conversation. I also don't know that I was, I was going to suggest that one of the answers is education. But I also don't know that our current educational system or models or ways of delivering knowledge and information through education, I don't think we've got that figured out. So that to me is like a whole other set of conversation. I was involved, I was, I was an interim provost in UW Extension when we got the flex degree program up and onto its feet. And that's kind of like an early example of where we could go in the world or at least in the country with education. Um, but I, so I think we're going to, Again, we could do a whole presentation on the impact of technology on education. But I think education has to be part of that equation. I'm not sure how long I should go here. I do appreciate, let's maybe do one more question because I want to go to the back of the room. Yes. If you strictly, if you strictly focus on our Wisconsin agriculture and dairy industry, if you have all these technologies, uh, the whole thrust of technology is to have efficient farming and efficient daily production. And if, say, the production increases triple fold, mm -hmm. say, in dairy or anything, mm -hmm. how do you account for some of the policies by other countries and things like this year we saw Canada suddenly stopping uh, cheese or some product that drove down the price of dairy down and Wisconsin dairy farmers suffered a lot. Yeah. How do you know? Well, we actually had some, some, as you probably know, some policy changes which actually locked, I think about 100 dairy farmers in Wisconsin out of the Canadian markets, which is also probably part of your question. No, the question but, is, with this increased production, I feel they are going to suffer more 
not knowing how they are going to have the excess production at their hands. So in a way, I can also see the negative aspect of introducing so much technologies into our agriculture and dairy system. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. I think, you know, we have, we have a total worldwide food problem now, but, it's, but that problem is also partially about distribution and equal distribution. We got way too much milk here in the state of Wisconsin, or at least we did a month or two ago. And we've got other parts of the world that literally people are dying from hunger. So, so I think the, the distribution issue is part of the answer to that. Um, when I, when I talk about the need to double food production, a lot of that doubling is actually going to happen in those developing countries of the world. Again, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, many of those countries are very fertile and they have great, great economic and production potential that is not realized. So yeah, I, I don't see all this stuff happening just in Wisconsin. The more we produce in Wisconsin, at least for the foreseeable future, we're going to have some of these market policy-based barriers. And that's going to be a problem. And thank goodness none of, that's, none of this is connected to politics, right? <laughs> Tom, I, I think I've probably... Is that good? Yeah. I, Otherwise? Again, I appreciate everybody's attention tonight. Thanks for having me.